Uh, today, I'm happy to announce that we are going to have an imminent uh, lineup of people uh, that are going to discuss what is presented here on the, uh, on, the, uh, on, on the big board, which is security in Northern Europe. Now, I must honestly say uh, that for the Netherlands, uh, for the last couple of years, I have the idea that maybe our focus was not always on the north. Uh, our focus was on Afghanistan. Recently, we're also discussing uh, the security situation in the Mediterranean, uh, with the Pax Americana leaving, I think maybe perhaps that is about time. Obviously, with uh, the American president constantly um, pushing us for more defense spending, um, the security debate and the defense debate is very much back in the center of political debate, and that's where it should be. With the establishment of the state armament program in 2020, Russia set very high targets for its armed forces. By 2020, the target was that 70% of the weapon system should be replaced by new ones. A sharp increase in defense spending resulted in new weapon systems, higher readiness, and a new extensive training and exercise pattern. Given the extreme concentration of power in Russia, this setup makes it possible to act very fast and comprehensively. SNAP exercises are used to check the readiness of Russian forces, also in the north. Exercises have shown that mobility is improved, and this gives Russia possibilities to employ their forces at short notice for operations on their own territory, as well as to international engagements, for example, in Syria. NATO, uh, as a pragmatic uh, organization, has sort of done it in stages, in slices. Um, the first chunk, uh, of course, has been to look at the northern central part, particularly Poland and the Baltic states, for the obvious reason that after the Russian annexation of Crimea uh, five years ago, uh, that's where the initial challenge was coming from. Russian troops were in Ukraine, the large Russian exercises were just over the other side of the border, Russia was building new bases in the Western Military District, modernizing its forces there quite significantly, up to about 450,000, uh, more or less permanently deployed. And of course, as long as the imbro imbrogolio uh, in Ukraine was going on, nobody quite knew if Russia would get, as has happened, bogged down in the Donbass, or, or would try to extend its military uh, power uh, beyond the, the the two so-called independent republics of Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, further into uh, eastern Ukraine. So uh, unsurprisingly, that's where the security vacuum was being felt uh, most uh, urgently. You can argue that NATO has caught up quickly in, in that respect. We now have four multinational battalions, uh, battle groups deployed in the th each of the three Baltic states, uh, uh, together, of course, with another one led by the United States in Poland. The new NATO command structure has not only increased by 1,200, the personnel in the headquarters, but has made these commands focus much more on the regional situation instead of being the rather generic anywhere, anytime commands that they were uh, at the beginning of uh, the uh, century. We've set up the NATO force integration units. Uh, Sven already mentioned a very intensive program of exercising and, and training to try to get, a, get our forces back in, into the mobility, the war fighting, uh, the coordination skills that have atrophied, if we're honest, in the days when they were mainly working separately. Uh, we have uh, brought in Finland and Sweden, not into collective defence, they have chosen still to remain outside NATO, but in host nation support agreements, regular cooperation in exercises, uh, involvement in NATO concepts like the NATO response force, um, and uh, with a sense of uh, what they could expect from NATO, uh, uh, not Article 5, but what other things they could expect uh, in a conflict situation, and what we might expect them uh, to provide. But that said, we also recognize that this is only phase one, and there are very significant long-term problems that we need to address or challenges as we look at reinforcing deterrence and defense. I mean, the, the key question is always, is it enough? You don't want to under-insure. Uh, that would be risky. The second issue 
is reinforcement. This is the big one. You know, last time we did this in the Cold War, there were 326,000 American troops in Europe uh, with 13,000 American tanks and 2,000 American aircraft, uh, the equivalent number of helicopters. You know the score. So the reinforcements were already there. Um, and therefore, we could sort of hold off a Soviet uh, attack for some considerable time, even with some guarantee of, of success. That, of course, is not the case. We have 33,000 US forces in Europe uh, today. That number is not likely to significantly in increase. Uh, and therefore, we are basing our strategy on reinforcement. In other words, we've got to get to the Baltic States before Russia gets to the Baltic States. Uh, and this, of course, is a challenge. It's a challenge of military mobility, uh, being able to generate the forces, transport them quickly uh, across uh, uh, Europe in a matter of days. And uh, that challenge also is a practical one. We have now got US tanks that can't go through German tunnels, uh, trains with tank transporters that can't run on railway networks because of gauge uh, problems. Uh, we have got limitations on German outer bonds of being able to transport live ammunition. Uh, uh, we, we are spending the money uh, but we are not necessarily achieving the high degree of readiness that we need uh, for a, a surprise, uh, a sudden crisis, and the need to deploy quickly. Um, one idea that uh, NATO has come up with, which makes a lot of sense, adopted at the summit, is the so-called 430s, to have 30 air wings, 30 uh, ships, 30 battalions ready within 30 days uh, to provide that initial uh, ready support. Uh, the recent NATO defence ministers meeting was positive in that several countries already declared that they can contribute to this. Um, a third element, of course, is the authority of the SACUR in this situation. Uh, if you are dealing with a surprise attack, uh, the need to uh, adopt uh, uh, strategic awareness and early warning and anticipation and start moving forces around early on. That means that you have to delegate to your military authorities the kind of power that they had in the Cold War, for instance, over the ace mobile force in those days, over air defense or air assets, to be able to use them not to fight, but to stage, to get ready. Uh, but that comes against a background where for the last 30 years we've had our military commanders under a very tight leash in terms of rules of engagement, what they were allowed to do or not do in places like Iraq or Afghanistan or the Balkans. And therefore we have to get the balance right between political control, the politicians ultimately make the decision, but the ability of the military not to be held back and lose time in a crisis situation. Let me finally just sum up what I think the three big challenges are uh, as we deal with the North. And so the High North, those are the three dimensions. Baltics, uh, Norway, uh, High North, and then Atlantic, North Atlantic. But uh, to my mind, the, 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 the methodologies are in three ways. First of all, the locals, of course, have to defend themselves. They have armies, they have militias, they have home guards. Uh, the Baltic states have recreated also, like Poland has, very much this kind of self-defense hope guard. So how do we work more closely with the local forces that the, the nations have in terms of improving their defense and their resilience, so particularly in the early stages? This is, this is important. It's not just NATO working with other NATO countries, that is important, but we have to be much more deeply connected to the local uh, resilience, emergency relief forces than we've been for many years years in a truly whole of government joined up approach. Challenge number one. Challenge number two, what is going to be the articulation of these regional groups that Sven described, the Northern Group and others, with NATO as a whole? What can we depend upon the regional structures to do in terms of regional cooperation, common air defense, common maritime assets, and, and what they would pr pr ask the collectivity of NATO to uh, provide? And finally, uh, the EU's aspiration to play a greater role in defence. Talk of this is very often about you know how all this is going to get the EU more involved in Africa or the Middle East or you know the areas far beyond Europe. Uh, uh, even they're talking about 15,000 kilometres strategic distance from Brussels. I'm not against this, but I think particularly given the way in which the United States is stretched at the moment. Uh, the whole debate about burden sharing in the alliance, I think it would be very good if the EU could also think about how some of these new capabilities can reinforce collective defence. You know, why not EU battle groups up in the high north and uh, not just NATO battle groups? Uh, and so I think that that is going to be very much part of it as well. That, uh, this was said by Sven, we need a greater articulation between NATO and the EU as to how these assets, 360 degrees, benefit all regions of the alliance 
uh, and not just areas where the EU has traditionally been involved. Uh, Tried and Juncture. So to go quickly after what, what was Tried and Juncture about, uh, it was a, a major exercise in September, December, so a three-month time frame, uh, uh, which actually was a, a large-scale NATO exercise. Uh, so it came with um, the transportation, but also with the reception, staging, armored movement, integration of forces, a phase of uh, combat-enhanced training, as well as forces integration training, set fit, and then finally three weeks of uh, the exercises and then transportation back. We haven't done that for quite some time. Uh, well, first of all, also to us, it was the first time, I think, uh, since uh, 1988 that we had such a large exercise. Uh, it was a, really the biggest joint exercise for decades. Uh, it was also about preparing for the NATO Response Force 2019. That was actually predominantly Army and uh, Air Force. It was also part of a, well, a stepping stone for NRF 2020, predominantly Navy. One NL Maritime Forces uh, were active. Um, it also came with an active media plan. Uh, a media plan to tell the people um, back home, societies, that we were truly uh, practicing a major combat operation. Uh, so the national themes of enhancing our readiness and also military mobility were portrayed in, in the media. So over the last 25 years, we've been, able, we've been busy conducting crisis response operations. We have been fighting the wars of choice. Now we uh, convert to the wars of necessity. We have to be there, um, uh, which is a complete different mindset. What is also of the essence is interoperability. And that's, I said a few words when I started. It's a technical interoperability, specifically in the land domain, uh, which is causing a lot of troubles, uh, but also in the air domain, even with Link 16, even in the maritime domain, with uh, NATO secure wide area networking, because it's not only the technical interoperability, it's also the procedural interoperability and the cultural interoperability. And that's something to work on. But finally, and that's my concluding remark, even with all the concerns and observations, we have to learn, which is also a cultural mindset piece, that we are aiming and preparing for perfection to conduct our operational tasks, to have the ranks filled, to have enough uptime for our material, to have the stockpiles, the ammunition, the fuel, and whatnot. But at the end of the day, if, it is, if we are called upon and we are in a fight, we have to execute it as it is, which is also a mind shift. So we have to, we, there is no time to send letters to parents at home that their son or daughter died. We have to fight. The mindset of a crisis response operation towards a combat operation requires that after day one of this combat operation, there's no time to regain. There's, uh, we have to continue to fight, even if it is with a lot of downtime for our material, people that are not completely trained and order shortfalls. This is what I believe Article 5 is about. I am more confident today than I was five or ten years ago. Because if you go back to 2010, there was no mindset, there was no uh, understanding of the risk. Mm -hmm. And I believe that um, we have done a lot in the Western world to increase the terms after 2010. And I believe the risk for anybody who would plan to do something like that is seen to be much higher today than it was. And the fact that Sweden and Finland have integrated so much with NATO and all regional Green groups uh, makes it unlikely, I think, to, that would happen. But it all depends on the perception in Moscow. And I, I believe that we have been sending so many signals now that um, the risk of engaging the whole of the West would be very, very high. So I, I think not. Um, and I'm looking now in particular to Jamie, um, coming from NATO. Can you reassure us that, indeed, cohesion is not an issue, or is indeed those alarming articles that warn us that the, the emergence of the populist governments in Europe in particular are eroding our coalitions in the EU and NATO from within? Uh, 
it's difficult, right? Uh, let's not, you know, hide the problems under the carpet or pretend uh, it's all rosy. It, it is difficult. I, I've you know, known many Secretary Generals of NATO where once, when they left, uh, they got a letter from a foreign minister or head of state saying, thanks, mate, you saved NATO. Uh, you know, we've come close on many, many occasions uh, to, to, to breaking apart. And, you know, everybody thinks that it all started when Donald Trump was elected president. But, France, you know very well from the history that, you know, virtually no year uh, in NATO's history has gone by without some major transatlantic crisis on Vietnam, on Kosovo, on the Gulf War, on gas pipelines. I mean, the list is almost uh, uh, infinite. You know, we've had Gennard de Gaulle, you know, we, we've always had the difficult allies and, and, and the like. Uh, uh, when you look back, it all seems to be remarkably stable. But as you're going forward and living it, there's always these anxieties and uncertainties. And so NATO does not go on automatic pilot. You know, it needs leadership. If the leadership is there, NATO pulls through. Uh, you know, people find compromises. One side agrees with another. Stoltenberg has said that the future of NATO is not guaranteed. And he's absolutely uh, 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 correct. But that said, that said, the fundamentals are often more solid than we actually think. You know, it's like a house where the roof is shaking all the time, and that's what the camera is trained on. But if the camera just sort of you know, pivots down from the roof to the foundations, they're much more stable. I mean, what is interesting about Trump is that he's actually provoked uh, the greatest show of support for NATO in the United States that I've witnessed in a generation. I've never seen so many American newspapers writing editorials in favor of NATO. So many votes in the US Congress say, you don't get to mess with our alliance, Mr. President. You don't, you don't get to take us out of NATO. You can't spend money taking us out of NATO. If we are really useful, we should be able to convince even Donald Trump uh, of, of our utility. So we should take him on, you know. Uh, and of course, uh, it shows that this organization in the 21st century is a democratic, accountable organization. And it can't expect all the time to get a free pass, like a sacred cow, from some deep questioning about what it, where its utility is and where its added value is. But if it really is a good product, it shouldn't find it too difficult to provide those answers. So I see Trump as a, as a healthy challenge that we should take on. And the Secretary General Stoltenberg definitely sees it that way, uh, with some success in, in convincing Trump gradually, I think, that, you know, to take, not to fall in love with the alliance, but to accept that uh, having it there is better for the United States than not having it at all. Thank you very much.